Yeah, good morning, everyone. My name is Claudio Anlicker, and I'm happy to introduce this work that I've done together with my colleague Giovanni Camurati and my supervisor, Sejan Chapkun, in the domain of secure ranging with ultra wideband. Now, ranging describes the process of establishing or measuring the distance between two devices by means of uh, radio frequency waveforms or communication. And we're interested in, doing the, interested in doing this securely because there are use cases like the ones that you see on my slides where we want to take access control or authorization decisions based on the outcome of these measurements. The most popular uh, of these use cases is probably the one of passive keyless entry and storage systems, which allows a car to measure the distance between itself and a key fob which enables you to walk towards your car and open the car when you touch the handle without pulling out your keys, uh, simply because these uh, two devices can measure the distance between them. Now, in these use cases, we are mainly interested in preventing so-called distance reduction attacks. So if this key, for example, is somewhere in your, in, in your house and an attacker manages to convince the car that the key is actually close by, even though it isn't, then that's an issue because the car might unlock and uh, might even be driven away. On the other hand, if the attacker manages to increase the distance between the key fob and the car, then that's not really something we're concerned about with uh, in this work. Now, how does ultra-wideband fit into the picture here? So the large bandwidth of ultra-wideband communication allows the transmitter to send waveforms whose time of flight can be measured with high precision. And that allows us to build systems that follow the so-called time of flight uh, ranging principle um, so you can assume here, for example, a car, a locked car with a key, uh, with, a, with a certain clock, and this clock measures the round trip time, essentially, of, uh, of waveforms between itself and the key fob, and if this time is below a certain measure, uh, below a certain boundary, then it might unlock. This can be secured uh, by cryptographic means, meaning by uh, transmitting pseudo-random sequences, it can be made sure that the attacker, uh, that an attacker in the middle here doesn't know, uh, doesn't know this sequence and cannot launch uh, trivial distance reduction attacks. What becomes apparent here is that the whole thing is very sensitive to clock errors because the speed of light by which these um, waveforms are transmitted needs about uh, one nanosecond to, uh, to uh, propagate for 30 centimeters. And furthermore, these chips here, they have clocks which are rather cheap. So these errors exist and they have to be compensated for. Now the question is, if we assume a strong, uh, strong, uh, strong threat model with an attacker who completely controls the wireless channel and these uh, compensation mechanisms, is there a way that we could exploit this to run distance reduction attacks? And this is something we analyzed in our work. And you see here uh, two attacks or our major contributions. So the first one is mixed down, which is an uh, attack related to device clocks in current ultra wideband devices. So we tested this, uh, this uh, attack against off the shelf ultra wideband chips. And something I want to point out here is that not only the current standard is affected, but based on what we know about the future standard, it seems like also the next standard might suffer from this vulnerability. It mainly targets the so-called single-sided two-way ranging mode, and what that means I'm gonna uh, explain in a second. The second attack is called stretch and advance, and it is at this point at least only conceptual because it targets the, the, the upcoming standard, which is not yet final and for which devices do not exist. And that's also the reason why this is not something we could practically evaluate, but we analyze, analyzed it uh, extensively and we uh, proposed a countermeasure against this attack. We will, for the remainder of this presentation, focus on the mixed down attack for, uh, simply for the sake of time. And to do that, I want to now briefly introduce the single-sided two-way ranging mode, which is kind of the basis for this, uh, for this attack. We have here the car and the key fob again. We can generalize this here, though, and talk about the initiator and the responder to kind of refer to the functions or the, the roles that these chips take in the context of ultra wideband ranging. We assume for the, at the beginning here that they share an ideal clock, so there are no clock errors, and we will discuss the errors in a second. But the initiator can now intro, uh, introduce or start the ranging procedure by sending a message to the responder, which the responder will receive after some delay marked on this uh, uh, horizontal axis. When the responder receives that message, 
it has to process it and send a reply. And that needs a certain amount of time. Let's say one millisecond, which is kind of um, the order of magnitude that you can expect here. This millisecond corresponds to a certain number of ticks on the clock that the responder has. Has. And after this millisecond, it sends the reply to the initiator, and we assume that the initiator here knows that this time t reply that the responder used. If it doesn't, we can simply transmit this, and all the initiator has to do on its side is to measure this round trip time, and then it essentially has all the information necessary to compute the time of flight, because it can apply the similar formula. And by deducting the reply time from the round trip time, all that remain uh, from the round time, and dividing the difference by two, all that remains is the time of flight that it, the uh, signal needed to propagate between the devices. Now, this is kind of an ideal world, and in practice, no two device clocks go at exactly the same speed. And we can, without a loss of generality, assume here that the responder's clock is slightly too slow. And we describe this difference, or we call this difference, between the clock speed of an ideal nominal clock and a, and a real clock as the clock drift, or clock frequency offset. And this is a quantity that is negative for slower clocks and positive for faster clocks. In this case, with a negative uh, clock drift, what we have is a responder that literally ticks slower, which means it takes more absolute time before it sends this reply. And this actual time, as if it were measured by an external clock, by an ideal clock, corresponds to this one minus c times the actual t-reply. Then, it's exactly the same thing. The responder responds, the initiator measures the round trip time, but we see here, in order to get uh, an accurate time of flight measurement, the initiator has to know how much time the, the responder used uh, in reality. And that means it has to apply this formula to make sure it uh, compensates correctly for this clock error that the responder has. The problem here is that the initiator has, to, by the way, this is the actual formula, how it is used, so how it is written in the standard. But this means that the initiator now has to estimate this C somehow to have this knowledge. Luckily for the initiator, the, this clock drift does not only change the speed by which the responder's clocks tick, but also the, the waveforms that it generates. So all the frequency, all the radio frequency generated by the responder are affected by this clock error which means, again, compared to an ideal clock on the left, you see that on the right, the frequencies are kind of stretched, so they're lower frequencies, and especially the carrier frequency generated by the responder is something that can be uh, measured by the initiator based from this difference, from this stretch, it is able to compute the C. And this is something that we uh, can exploit in the mixed down attack, because what we can now make here, add here, is a a malicious party that kind of tries to exploit this, this compensation that we essentially base on this carrier frequency offsets that we measure over the air. So we have again kind of the same environment here. So the attacker stays passive in one direction. The responder replies after a certain time, but when the response comes, then the attacker becomes active. And what they actually do is simply point an antenna towards the responder pick up the signal, and then change the carrier frequency of these waveforms by a tiny bit. And this is enough, by, in combination with amplifying this response, to convince the initiator, or here the car, that actually the clock of the responder is going at a slower speed, even though it isn't. So the initiator here estimates this C prime, how I call it here, which is actually the, the clock drift artificially introduced by the attacker. And it thinks that the, the responder is going slow, and this kind of leads to an overcompensation that uh, results in a distance reduction attack. So this is uh, what's happening here. And we tried this out in, in practical attacks against off-the-shelf chips, so not against uh, kind of real car and key fobs, but on chips on device boards, which we put about 10 meters apart in our lab. And you see that the moment we uh, start the attack at this about 40 second mark, what happens is that we get immediate and also reliable distance reductions. So under lab conditions, it's pretty much possible to get 100% success rate because all the, the attacker has to do is to convince uh, the chip 
that uh, uh, to lock to its own signal. And that's just a matter of using the power advantage that the attacker has. And that's pretty much all it. Something that is worth to point out here is that we don't necessarily have to follow this strict pattern of directly reducing the distance from 10 to zero, because that could also easily be spotted by, uh, by a countermeasure, for example. But since the attacker completely controls this kind of stretch, it introduces this uh, clock uh, change, it can also do this in a, in a smoother way to kind of simulate the person approaching the car and gradually reduce the distance from 10 meters to, let's say, zero meters. To sum this up, uh, the mixed down attack that uh, I introduced affects only single-sided two-way ranging and not the double-sided one, which is used today by most uh, security sensitive applications. Um, but the upcoming standard seems to use single-sided ranging as a default. The, regarding countermeasures, um, there is no silver bullet inside. We go into more detail in the paper here, but it's hard to, uh, to prevent this because to have a correct measurement, the initiator is required to do some compensation, and we can simply um, explo exploit that. Now, yes, the alternative would be to use uh, the double-sided two-way ranging, which is also what we recommend in our paper. Now, to conclude, the takeaways of uh, our presentation and our work is that we exploit in this attack the clock drift compensation in single-sided two-way ranging. We do not change the message content, so any kind of higher layer or cryptographic uh, primitives to pro prevent this won't work, they won't, uh, won't help. We have a high success rate. Uh, the reductions, they depend on the chip's response time on this T-reply that uh, is being scaled. And there is no story for a countermeasure. The stretch and advance attack, which I didn't introduce today, is a conceptual attack against a new standard. It affects both the single-sided and the double-sided two-way ranging modes. It can lead to potentially huge reductions, although there's a huge uncertainty in there because this is, as I said, still not finalized. And we provide in our paper an analysis and countermeasure against these attacks. And with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.